Hello all. Uh, my name is Dave Nelson. I'm director of Baylor University Press and it is my delight to welcome you to this afternoon's event. We're very glad you all are here. Uh, today we will be hearing from John Greening, who has traveled far to be with us today. He will be reading from his most recent collection, The Interpretation of Owls, Selected Poems 1977 to 2022. It's a Baylor University Press book and we are very proud to have it as part of our list. Um, the book was edited by Kevin Gardner, who is chair and professor of English here at Baylor and also the chair of our University Press Committee. And uh, Professor Gardner will be coming up in a moment to give a word of introduction to today's reading. I just want to say one quick uh, word of housekeeping, and that is that we have plenty of books available for you to purchase, um, and John will also be uh, around to talk, uh, answer any questions you may have. After the reading today, we'll all go, those who can remain, we'll all go downstairs to the reception room down there and we have books and an area set aside for discussion and conversation. Uh, again, thank you for coming today and Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Dave. So it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, John Greening, as we celebrate the launch of his new collection, The Interpretation of Owls, just published by Baylor University Press. John is one of the most versatile and accomplished of contemporary poets. Over the last 45 years, he has published 14 volumes of original poetry and another 13 chapbooks as well as numerous essays and reviews, plays and libretti, critical books and editions, and anthologies. The past five years has been a period of tremendous creativity, with eight new poetry volumes and two essay collections published. One of his most impressive works is called The Silence, published to great acclaim in 2019. Its long central poem contemplates the 30-year-long writer's block suffered by the composer Jan Sibelius, something I don't think that John has ever suffered. <laughs> John has received numerous awards and honors. One of the earliest came when the poets Ted Hughes and Seamus Heaney selected him as a finalist for the Observer Arvon Prize in 1987. Since then, he has won the Chumley Award the Bridport Prize, and the TLS Centenary Prize. He has been a Hawthorne Fellow, a Fellow in the English Association, and a Royal Literary Fund Writing Fellow at Cambridge. Today we are here not only to celebrate this book, but also the fact that this is John's first American book. So I want to thank Baylor University Press and its extraordinary staff for taking on this project. I also want to thank John for entrusting it to me. I was deeply honored and humbled when John asked me about three years ago if I would consider editing a selection of his poetry for an American press, to take his work in hand, have the responsibility for what poems to include, and decide how to arrange them. Once I overcame my initial trepidation, I chose a thematic rather than chronological arrangement. Some sections are strongly associated with the places he has called home, such as Upper Aswan, Egypt, where he and his wife Jane were volunteers and teachers. Clinton, New Jersey, where he taught in an American high school. Hounslow, near London, where he grew up beneath the Heathrow flight path and rural Huntingdonshire, which technically doesn't exist, though John has lived there lo these many years. Other sections in the book will suggest the passions of the spirit, the intellect, the soul. You might think that editing the interpretation of owls was a labor of love, but that's not quite accurate because there was no labor involved. It was a keenly enjoyable collaboration made possible by endless chats in WhatsApp, often at very odd hours of the day, 
being separated by six time zones. I think John and I both owe a debt of gratitude to our wives for their endless patience with our unusual working schedule. No, there was no labor involved. How could there be when John's poems bring such pleasure? When there is so much aesthetic accomplishment to savor, such brilliant wit and judgment. I hope you will enjoy them as much as I do. Please join me in welcoming John Greeny. Thank you so much. I've only just seen how many of you there are. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin, for that superb introduction. Um, it, it was a joy working together. Uh, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you to the press who produced um, a book I could never dream of, of having. It's so beautifully done. Uh, we don't do things like this in England, I tell you. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, thanks to the library for hosting this event. Um, let's start with... I'm not using a mic. We decided that I would use my natural voice, so I hope that I don't become inaudible. Um, I shall do my best not to gabble. Let's begin with a poem that, where it all started. Um, Kevin edited a wonderful anthology of poems about English parish churches, and he chose this one for it. I live in a flat part of England, and one of the features is all the churches the spires, the towers that you see on the horizon. And read this poem depends on a kind of comparison between those and, and children flying kites. East Anglian churches. They dance like paper cutouts on a length of fishing line across our windy county. The tail of a kite so high it's almost out of sight. The cross of a man's agony held by a child with his hands together on holy ground. They dance, a tower, a spire, a porch, a flying buttress, to the fantasia of an organ, to the thunder repelling carillion. And they call to dance those who have forgotten what it means to stop walking, stop running, and skip, hop, hornpipe to the music in the nave. If ever the wind drops, what then? And already there is a change in the weather. One paper cutout is gone, another is torn. The kite itself is flying erratically. The dance is uncertain. The music is played by old arthritic fingers. There are bell ropes hanging unused. Sing your shaker tunes. Sing your Wesley anthems, sing, sing hymns ancient and modern for the child with his hands together, for the children who will find the paper fragments littering the landscape. Make boats of them, make a treasure hunt of them, and not know the secret in these crossed sticks, this fabric, the very wind. And this seems to be a windy city. It really does. Um, walking. Uh, Kevin and I walked around Waco, walked through the zoo actually yesterday and along the river. I love walking. And so do my whole family, really. And this is, I'm thinking of my sister in this next poem, who, who walks ridiculous. I, mean, I never go walking with her because she walks so fast and so far. Um, but Kevin, in his thematic arrangement, called the first section Pilgrim, very shrewdly, I think. So this is walking. I'm thinking particularly of England's Peak District here. There's a village called Eam, where the London plague broke out um, in the 17th century, and the whole village was shut off. So that's a little reference to that place. Eam, it's pronounced Eam, but spelt E-Y-A-M, bizarrely. Walking. One moment basking in the sun, the next knee deep in snow, Astonished at the way these tracks must have filled to the top of their dry stone walls during the April blizzards. To walk has been the idea since we were small, and so we go on along new paths and old, the way our parents led us, listening for a curlew, looking at a weird extended ash, checking our watches for the train, 
stopping for elevenses among the sheep droppings. It is a rhythm that we require that speaks of essences and immortality. Not a pilgrimage, because there is no aim. The route is circular, but a stay against age, climbing edge after edge, then out across the moor above Eme, that hostel you think you stayed in once. Well, where poetry really began for me was in Egypt. As, as Kevin mentioned, Jane and I lived in Upper Egypt in Aswan. Um, I taught there for, for two years, very remote, very wonderful place. And what was I reading? I was reading mainly William Carlos Williams, actually, and imagist poems. So a lot of those early poems are long, thin. You remember Williams wrote his poems on prescription pads. That's why they're long and thin, because he was a doctor. So my poems are long and thin. And I, was, I didn't really take photos, didn't take pictures. Unimaginable, isn't it? it, it we take pictures of everything. And so I wrote poems. And so they're trying to capture the, the scene. Um, but the very first poem about Egypt that I wrote is called Westerners, because we were Westerners. But for the ancient Egyptians, the Westerners were the dead, because they buried them on the west bank of the Nile. Westerners. We ferried our past across here, our furniture, our favorite things, the familiar parts of our life. We reconstructed them to make ourselves an opulent future and barricade oblivion. You will recognize us among these everlasting earth treasures in a gold mask or in black granite, in the clean slot of a hieroglyphic, though you thought we were dead and strange, you will recognize us. We are still here. We are the Westerners. And one of those um, long, thin poems that I mentioned, this is about Nefertiti. It's really, I'm thinking of that famous bust of Nefertiti in the Berlin State Museum. Um, and this is one of my wife's favorites, actually. Uh, and it's a bit mysterious. It's very strange reading poems that are so old. And one of the fascinating things about this project is Kevin suddenly said, well, can we include this one? I don't even remember. It's like looking at something by someone else. Um, but this one uh, has been around for some while. Nefertiti in the north. Not to be closer to the roots of this rose. In lands where they say the Nile no longer flows, but falls like the sunlight. Not to be watching the bird catchers crouch where the gardens end outside my window and that same figure on my wall. Not for the paintings of his nets and his dog driving from the papyrus thickets a slim-necked waterfowl. Not for these. And not to be quenched by the sight of the sand's disregard for his sacred boundaries. Never to scoff in triumph. The beautiful woman has come has come. But since the king is in the south in the company of his dear Smenkare, I have come to this castle in the north. I should have explained Nefertiti actually means the beautiful woman has come. So the beautiful woman has come, has come. The trouble with a, the only trouble with a fact selected like this is when you're reading, you, you've got a lot of pages to get through. Normally with a slim volume, you flick from seamlessly from one poem to the next. So I have to, I've got all kinds of sticky things here to remind me. The story of Tutankhamun was one that I, I didn't write about immediately when we were in Egypt. It required a whole book. So I wrote a sequence called the Tutankhamun Variations. Um, and since it, well, it was just past the anniversary of this discovery of Tutankhamun, uh, I'll read this poem from that. Um, Carter, Howard Carter, who, who discovered it, was really the, the, the Arab water boy who discovered it, tripped over a, a step. He, he was the one who really discovered it. Um, but Howard Carter was from Norfolk, a, a simple family he came from. And I imagine what the local aristocracy must have thought of this, this young upstart becoming so famous. He'd been a 
painter of, he sort of used to paint the aristocracy's pets. Uh, that's why he was good at, as an archaeologist, because he could draw all the, all the things they discovered. Carter at Swaffham. We know him. It's the Carter lad who painted dear Lady Amherst's lap dog and the vicar's old bull terrier, quite without schooling, son of our gamekeeper's son. And if his imagination pierces a tiny hole in these venerable walls and holds a candle through to a room full of wonderful things, but utterly foreign to a decorously mounted hunting party, with its fine equipage, its whips and sticks and stuccoed wooden courtesy, then what is that to us? Tally ho and on towards the 20th century, let the boy be content with keeping trespassers from our noble pile or immortalize our ailing golden retrievers. He became something of a golden retriever himself. <laughs> um, Kevin selected a more recent poem. I've been writing about Egypt ever since we went there. Almost every book was something about Egypt. This is a more recent one. And it was a, a sequence of poems I wrote about um, uh, some tomb paintings in the British Museum called Nebermoon's Tomb. It's a quick swig. Um, and it made me think of my parents who were keen gardeners. Slightly longer poem, this. There is a garden. There is a garden in the next world where all the birds and fish and plants that we have exterminated are being kept. I think it is this seed bank that I visit occasionally when I am sleeping and wake to feel as if some part of me has gone out and spent the night traveling, as Egyptians used to believe, and so would leave a false door out of their tombs. Within that garden, which I imagine to be like the one at Kew, where my parents lived, where I was born and taken through the penny turnstile, and in which there is no perspective, fish and ducks lying sideways against the surface of the pool, trees unfolded flat from its edges, yet where all comes into a true angle because the light is the light that was in Egypt when we were there. The fragmentation of the tomb will hardly matter. This will be enough, just as a speck of DNA can reconstruct the scene, the life. I'm hoping that in this garden, there is somewhere that I can learn to plant and grow things as I never let myself be taught by my father or to pave a proper path as I watch my mother do. There will be fruits there. I can see them in this last surviving scene, the dates, the figs, the ghastly doom, but also grapes and some papyrus for writing on too, if in that garden writing is allowed. Yes, both my parents lived near Kew Gardens and, and I spent my first months there too. So gardens are, play, I'm a useless gardener myself, but uh, they play an important part in my, in my mythology, personal mythology. Well, when Jane and I came back from Egypt, we, we went and taught Vietnamese boat people, uh, refugees from Vietnam who were living in, in Scotland. Uh, they were put all, all, all throughout the British Isles so they didn't end up in ghettos and we were teaching them English in, on, in northeast Scotland, in Arbroath. And I was reading a lot of Chinese poetry, because most of the Vietnamese were, in fact, ethnic Chinese. I was reading a lot of Chinese poetry translated by Arthur Whaley and Kenneth Rexroth, people like that, and sort of imitated that style in, in this little poem. It was about one of the, one of the students called Sai Mui. Sai Mui is embroidering. Her eyes point enters a wooden O. Her breath swells a small stretch of cotton to a silken bird of paradise, a silken tree of heaven, silk wings on a green silk moth. Saimui is embroidering. The shapes blow from her home 
ripple her smile, make her fingers gently quiver. The silkworm weaves with a slow and circular exactness, and the green moth comes to leaf. Well, as Kevin suggested, uh, one, one of the um, themes running through here is, is identity. The sections on home, the sections on, on Englishness. This one really is about identity because it's about the origin of my own name. Um, I'm sorry I'm not browning, but I am greening. So, uh, <laughs> and, and that name came from a tiny, tiny place on the edge of the River Severn, um, a place called Or. A W R E, uh, and I was giving a reading once, again in a fairly obscure place, nowhere near that, and I read this poem, and somebody came up to me and said, oh yeah, we live in Orr, and the Greenings have just moved back there for the first time in about 200 years. So I was awe, awestruck, as these words say. Um, so is it also Bart Simpson, or one of the Simpsons appears in this poem, if you're listening carefully, because of Matt Groening. Or, it is a hopeful name to be born to. It promises spring. It sings of pickings from a lost family orchard, an Eden on seven banks, a fruit that is ripe yet always green. Hold it to your cheek for the faint enigma. Lick it to your tongue, buds, and estuary. Cast, it will bob the equinox deep into English etymologies Grig and gurn and groan. Watch it running on a playing field with others of the inner city. Picked on, nicknamed, yellowed to a cartoon brat. Or beneath the hundred thousand crosses left by men who could never spell themselves. Imagine it grinning from their skulls or groaning in the pelvic bones of women who bore it. A surge from this serpent bend of the river into every green corner. I think in America, actually, a greening is a kind of small apple. Uh, a green corner is the, is the most likely original meaning. Uh, next poem's called Satellite. I know this is one that Kevin particularly likes, uh, perhaps because it's in rhyming couplets. It's a bit Alexander Pope-like. Um, it's a a kind of survey, a sort of satirical survey of England, Britain, in the, I think it was written in the 90s. It's got a 90s feel about it. Um, so listen for the rhymes. Satellite. A dish points outwards from our outside wall to what we cannot see. Stars that know all more clearly than these nightly movie greats the fate of earthen empires. The new estates that blinker us from crystal ballroom spaces haul us on in their fiber optic traces, plow constellations. With a flash of shares you turning, leave the great and little bears extinct and gilt-edged bars of progress furrowed down the land's face. All that we have is borrowed, museums full of stuff trophies slowly decaying, territories that tick, holy marbles seeming to breathe, even these words I mix to purity and this island time we live on, living off cereals, then soap, and lastly just news. That shooting green hope our parents plotted as the world turned red, not with sunset, nor shame, but foreign dead. We wait, hungry. Now we have cleaned the great from Britain. Scraped it out, shrunk it. Wait for a force beyond this uttermost story of our high rise. A column whose glory will be to have relieved us of our fame, of all that mafficking, cheering of a name picked blind from a skull and nailed to the sky. The dish receives its message from on high in beams that swaddle the earth, in curves of parabolic reckoning, then serves us word-made flesh, chained bare salami sprawled before us, while civilization's bald chronicler 
slots between those repeats of wars for king and country networked in the stars. Little reference to uh, Kenneth Clark's series Civilization. Did that ever make it out, out here, that, that, that TV series Civilization? It was the first program to go out when color TV arrived in Britain, a big uh, documentary series. <clears throat> um, so as, as Kevin again mentioned, I grew up near Heathrow Airport. And well, if you're not lucky enough to have been brought up with the daffodils and the lakes uh, of Cumbria like Wordsworth was, then you have to make do with what you have, which is airplanes and noise from airports. Though, I mean, you, you mythologize, as a child, you mythologize everything. So the, they used to test the engines. You'd hear this howling. And he was just like a, a wolf. And they discovered that they actually shot the last wolf in England on, the, on Hounslow Heath, where the, where the airport now is. So it's provided endless mythology for me. This poem called Heathrow alludes to that. Um, it, it was a very dangerous place, Hounslow Heath, originally. Um, it was, and it was also a place where druids had conducted human sacrifice. Uh, this is a poem that moves backwards. Martin Amos, I think, wrote a novel that, called Time's Arrow that ran backwards. Very clever novel. Uh, so this does something similar in poetry. And it's Heathrow, two words, because that's the name of the village that they destroyed in making the airport. A jet tips tail first towards the runway, where the tarmac has started to gleam and steam and peel itself back, revealing hardcore, then gravel, then loam, then clay, a flint flicker of glass passing, flowers into bulbs, beanstalks to shoots, sails slowing to ungrind wheat from manchet, to heath that is bog, that is scrub, that is forest clearing, clearing, so a sarsen can now rise for this perverse procession of darkening beards, where blood is uncongealed into a newly membered body led below de-ramifying mistletoe on oak trees that have begun to shrink to nothing but thunder followed by lightning and an uproar to the horizon of ice fronts, advancing, retreating as the earth shudders, floods, howls, ignites. I always need a drink after that, because it's all one sentence, that poem. <laughs> now, there should be a name for that, the, the one sentence poem, but there isn't. Um, is it Amy Clampett? Wonderful American poet Amy Clampett writes lots of one sentence poems, um, but there's no word for it. Right, where am I? Uh, oh, poets are supposed to write about nightingales. Do you get nightingales in America? I don't think you do, do you? But, of course, Keats set the standard. And I've never been quite convinced I was actually hearing a nightingale and not a sort of enthusiastic blackbird. Um, so <laughs> this is about trying to listen for nightingales and, and the reservoir near where we live. Lots of sounds going on in here. The, the, the nightingale is supposed to go jug, 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 taru, apparently, according to Eliot, anyway. Listening for nightingales. All the birds of the dusk sound beautiful. Is there one that sounds true? that empties a dark jug drunkenly as graphen water raises its H2O. Ah, Keats, I envy you your certainty. I too would fly by nightingale if I could be sure that that that's like a spring stuttering out of a broken pipe with a pure original song and not a drug on the market. Such black burdens the wings of my enchantment it plunges off the green grid, and there is nothing. That magic flew with your age and leaves me in the dark with mine. It's actually in Hampstead in London that Keats heard that nightingale too. Lucky so-and-so. Um, so this is in the flight section of the book. That was a sort of left field uh, approach of, of Kevin's to do a section called flight. I hadn't really thought about it. I write a lot about flight. Those planes, but birds too. Um, so this is a poem about geese, and written when Jane and I were living in New Jersey. Um, it was a, a fairly rural part of New Jersey. I know New Jersey has a reputation for being busy and crowded, but we were very fond of it. And geese used to fly from reservoir to reservoir. 
<clears throat> it's also a, a, a moral in this poem about how things date. You know when you watch those old films and nobody has a mobile phone, or a cell phone as you call them, uh, and, and you can tell how old it is. Well, I'm using the imagery here of, an old, of the old type of phone with one of those curly wires on it. I just wonder how long people will pick up that image. Geese, the information technology of geese can hear on its high white cirrus fibers when the cold is coming. Long distance calls awaken me each morning. I lift my head and let the programmed weather line croak on, watching slack coils of wire stretch until the message is communicated, then nestle back to snore snugly like a warm receiver. Another goose poem, um, the more recent, is dated 15th of January 2009, and you'll see why. It's called Augury. Just six lines. An Airbus hits a flock of geese. On a prayer and two powerless wings, the pilot makes a rare set down in water. Everyone survives. Air craftsmanship. Now grey goose-stricken engines lie feathering the icy Hudson, where ferries ply back and forth, hail the pilot, get no reply. I know the prose poem is very popular, and particularly popular over here, um, but one thing you can't do with a prose poem, the, the, that, that thrill of the line break. So in the middle of those six lines, I was able to split the word air craftsmanship. So you've got air, then space on the page, then craftsmanship. And that, I mean, that's, that's why I prefer poetry that isn't prose, if you see what I mean. Um, another little aerial one. Now, I, dare I say that word Brexit? Um, what, one, I, I'm many thousands of miles away from home, so I can. Um, and Canada Plus was one of the possible ways of, of leaving Europe. I, I can't remember the details of it. Um, but this is a poem about my wife's father, who was a, he taught, he, he was a Spitfire pilot. Uh, but he was such a good Spitfire pilot, they took him away from the war, Second World War we're talking about, to Canada to train other young men to fly Spitfires. Um, so this is about that. And uh, while I'm thinking about that, I'm also thinking about my wife, who's taught herself classical Greek over the past five years. Uh, and other things. So November 2018, Canada Plus for Jane, my wife. Why is a Spitfire doing loop the loops above our garden? Remembrance is finished, and surely there's nothing on at Old Warden or Duxford. Is someone celebrating today's divorce agreement? There he dives towards a field of nascent Brussels sprouts. Your father told us once how he had put his Spitfire into an inverted spin, simply to prove it wasn't impossible to get out of. He instructed pilots, but missed the war, cocooned for months in a tiger moth above Niagara Falls. What would he say about this latest piece of paper? May addressing Parliament as winter begins its march to where all summits end in meltdown. And what do you say, studying the frogs of Aristophanes intently, while the offstage chorus goes on chanting, Brexit? <laughs> well, Sibelius, who, about whom I wrote that long poem, um, The Silence, he visited Niagara Falls. He came to America several times, and he was tempted to write something about it write a piece of music about Niagara Falls. But he didn't, and this is about that. Sibelius in America. He looks at the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and is lost for words as the Maid of the Mist sails round and round. If he could only convey it. But no, it is too solemn and vast for painter, composer, or poet. It outreaches humanity. It plays unhearable, unbearable chords 
repeating and repeating in its thundering undertones simplicity, modesty, as the man in the white flannel suit, unspeaking, boards a ship for home and passes icebergs and hears how a certain princip shoots the Archduke. Behind him, caviar, acclaim, supremacy. That's one of the bits actually I cut out from the, from the long poem. It was far too long, that poem I wrote about Sibelius. I knew I had to cut it. And this is a moral to any of you who are writers, actually. Cutting is, the, is so important. But you've got to choose the moments. I waited for months and months. Suddenly, one afternoon, I saw how I could cut the poems. And I cut out about well, a third of the poem, at least. It was 1,200 lines originally. Uh, suddenly, it was possible. But was sat, uh, was that the composer Prokofiev used to do that. He never, let, he never threw anything away. So I, I never throw anything away. Recycle your work. See, poets can do that. Um, are we all right for time? I think we are. Um, yes, let's stay at Niagara Falls. I had a friend who was a composer, and he had a, a marvellous chance to write a piece of music to be performed in Wigmore Hall, which is a big hall in London, uh, for, for, for chamber music, uh, to be performed by the Dunedin Consort. So he said, oh, can you give me some texts to set to music? And he wanted it quickly. I thought, what can I, what can I write about? And I remembered I had a book of photographs of people doing strange things over Niagara Falls, um, barrels and, and tightrope walkers, blonde down the tightrope walker. So I wrote a sequence of poems about that, and this is Blondin walking his tightrope. Um, and it's fairly formal, structure, so it's a bit of a tightrope walk in itself, which is why I'm going to have a swig. Tightrope. Diving is nothing but paying out a hawser cable laid three inches in diameter, thirteen hundred dollars long to span Niagara. Blondin the Great has come. Paying is nothing but to stretch manila fibers taut from America's pleasure grounds to Canada, fasten them with 18 guy ropes, admit the world for 25 cents each. To boast is nothing, but to step onto that cable, walk halfway and drop a bottle on a string to crowds below, then up and drink the contents, cheers and off again. To walk is nothing, but to run along the tightrope, somersault in darkness, on stilts, or do it backwards, blindfold, in irons, on a bicycle, or once even pushing a wheelbarrow. To impress is nothing but to leave the watchers speechless, carrying a stove out to the center, cracking eggs and cooking a perfect omelet, eating it, then lowering portions to pleasure boats. To be famous is nothing but to be preserved on camera carrying one's manager across and recorded offering piggybacks to a prince, his royal highness whispering, thank God that's over. <laughs> to be a stuntman, nothing. But to be Blondin, retire to an English estate and title it Niagara. Die in your bed at the far end of a full span, the greatest of all stunts. There's an America section in, in the book. Um, some of the poems going back to when, when we, we were on that, uh, it was a Fulbright exchange. And we arrived in Washington with our four-year-old daughter and we, Fulbright people took us and showed us the sights. And the four-year-old did as four-year-olds do. She commented on everything we saw. And this is about that. Uh, and I, the title comes, there's a poem by Andrew Marvell about a child called little TC in a prospect of flowers. Well, this is called Katie in a prospect of DC. Outside the Oval Office, my daughter started to sing Humpty Dumpty. Then at a rising black wall that dropped to a V, she stopped singing and cried for a flag of stars to wave past the dark, window, dark windows of the Space Museum. On Capitol Hill, she chattered towards a life-size image of Jesus, was silent before the statue of the father of television, 
heard the floor whisper. But approaching Watergate, she pressed her investigative nose to the glass and broke in on our conversations again and again to report what all the King's men couldn't. <laughs> Last time I came to Balon, I'd also been to Ohio to uh, give a talk and a reading. And I had a bit of spare time there and walked up um, uh, um, in the grounds of an old asylum, a uh, beautiful area called the Ridges. And there were some fairly mad things going on politically at, at that time. So that's in the background of this. I was trying to escape it all, really, by, by walking. Uh, so it's November 2018. Asylum, Athens, Ohio. An early morning walk through the lunatic asylum's lonely, hilly grounds up to the ridges, where I had thought those birds following me were eagles, but they were vultures, and I kept on coming round to the same point. Ohio is quiet. Memorial weekend. The cemeteries are quieter still along the nature trail. Old inmates marked with small fluttering stars and stripes but nothing there for such a wingspan. Why does this blackness in my room where the news keeps on rolling, circling? Well, inevitably, war features. Uh, there is a section on warfare. And th this is a poem I'd, I'd sort of forgotten about. It was never in any of my collections. And again, Kevin found it. Um, and it's a villanelle. I think there are about three good villanelles in existence. This is not one of them. Um, Dylan Thomas's, Elizabeth Bishop's, Derek Mann. Um, maybe, actually, I think uh, Alicia Stallings has done a good one. Hearts and Minds, it's called. This is Iraq War. Your days are programmed on a shining disk. The moon locates us, Babylon and Ur. We click and move from task to aimless task. The dusty screen before me is a husk of sun rising from empire's fallen tower. Your days are programmed on a shining disk in cuneiform. What scholars now to ask? The scarabs push their dung. The wise stay poor. We click and move from task to aimless task. The West End winks. Come in and take the risk, though every act's a theatre of war. Your days are programmed on a shining disk. I shut the times. She stares into the dusk, the privilege of peace. But on the hour, we click and move from task to aimless task, as if through gas or virus. This one mask against all barefaced rumors of a cure. Your days are programmed on a shining disk. We click and move from task to aimless task. And where do I go now? This is where the system breaks down. So where do I go now? It would break down at some point. Ah. Yes, um, I've done a bit of translation from languages I sort of know reasonably well. German is the one I know best. Um, and this is from Goethe. I, I've just brought out a little selection of Goethe poems. Um, and this one didn't quite fit into that book, and, and <laughs> Kevin pounced on it. Uh, it it's, Goethe didn't write many sonnets, but he wrote a, a sonnet about why he didn't. Um, <laughs> being Goethe, you know, it had to be different. Uh, the, the, the octave of the sonnet, the first eight lines, is so people speaking to him, and then he gives the answer in the, in the sestet. The sonnet after Goethe. It is a sacred duty when creating to honor old traditions. Therefore, you may join us in this steady marked out queue and follow all our movements as you're waiting. We find such limitations are exciting when spirits are too urgent to subdue. It offers them a way of shining through, perfected, in your polished, formal writing. I wish I could. That's always been my aim, to measure feelings word by metered word. 
A sonnet rhymed, I would be proud of it. But no, I just can't settle in this frame. I'm used to carving single blocks of wood, but here need super glue to make things fit. There was no super glue in his time, but you know, this is one of the liberties one takes in translation. Um, so there's a few poems about other poets. I don't want to go on too long. Um, five minutes, or is that about right? Um, so let's see what of, oh yes. One about Yeats, but it's also a poem about writing poetry. Visited Yeats's tower, wonderful place in, in Ireland if you ever get a chance. It's another of those single sentence poems. Steps that are hard to learn, but follow the master as he sits, watching the dancer and the dance, music passing under his window, and let your feet attempt the slippery, winding rhyme and claws and line break up to the battlements where you can see the whole country, where you can see the stars move in patterns everyone knows, but no one knows how to follow so hard the steps. And one of the delights of this wonderfully edited, beautifully produced book is that on the opposite page, we've been able to put the poem about Sylvia Plath, who was delighted when she discovered a flat which had a blue plaque outside it with Yeats's name on. So the, the flat where she died was a building where Yeats had lived. Um, let me read the Sylvia Plath poem. It's commemorating anniversary, 11th of February in London. The snow flies in all directions, but doesn't settle. Elusive as reputation. We all need a page to write our names on. Yours is on Primrose Hill, where Yeats left his chalk mark, and children who have never heard of either of you long to make a snowman. It's half term. Those who were born that day are announcing their half century on Facebook, a blue plaque in the cloud. Your sylvan rides turn to slush, pavement grey, until the next fall. One year in ten there's such a winter. Warm yourself at the editorial bonfire. Watch the dying art of hedging and ditching. Forgive the crystal deceptions and let Ariel go. I did know Ted Hughes, but never spoke to him about Sylvia Plath. Um, just a quick four lines about American music. It's fairly esoteric, this one, but music lovers among you may get some of the references. American music. Samuel Barber asked for croutons to be scattered at his funeral. From the cortege, as the fresh soil steamed, adagio, Feldman, Carter, Crum, and all the products of Boulanger approached to salute and pepper him with their hard pieces. The final section in the book is called Intimations, some of those more mysterious poems, the odd ghost story. Um, well, I used to teach in a, the castle where Catherine of Aragon died, and the cleaners in the castle had seen her ghost. But I never, it all felt quite a friendly place to me. But then one night I was typing out a manuscript, a fat manuscript. In fact, I, I, it was for an American selected that never happened. And then strange things happened. In the castle, typing up on the top floor of the Tudor castle, I used to teach in, typing pages of old verse for some collection I dream of, trying to pass the late evening shift's long final hour, typing on a better computer than mine, hoping to store the text on its hard drive. One page more of the dozens, it's a sestina for the six wives, elaborate piece of artifice, compressing their lives into six verses and an envoy. No one believes this place where she died is really haunted, but typing away, I reached the passage where I'd written about the day of Catherine's funeral, how Anne Boleyn, and as I say, there are no ghosts. But at the line, the word Anne, 
the computer crashed. I typed it again, it crashed. And then the poem simply vanished. I exited, I ran. <laughs> I think that's probably a good time to leave. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, first of all, everyone, and thank you so much to John for making the trek across the Atlantic to be with us today. It was lovely. Um, we're going to have about 10 minutes for some Q&A, and so if you have any questions that you would like to ask both the author of the poetry or the editor of the collection, they will be available here, right here at this lectern. And then immediately following the Q&A, uh, I would invite all of you to join us for a free reception. There will be coffee, tea, and some sweet treats. Uh, seriously, students, staff, public, everyone is invited. And best of all, John and Kevin will be signing copies of the book, um, which will be on sale for 30% off. Um, it's typically $25, and now it's $17 and some change, which makes for some very affordable gifts to give to you and yours. Um, I'll invite Kevin and John to come up, but please do, uh, if you have time in your schedule, join us downstairs for the reception, the book signing. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> John, that was a fabulous reading. And uh, again, it was such an honor to work on this with you and so much fun. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for John? I wrote that book called The Silence, and the famous silence of poetry readings where you say, are there any questions? I think we have one over here. <laughs> we have some. <laughs> Isn't that a curious thing? Um, it's a, I suppose you're sort of asking me what my signature poem is. You know, Seamus Heaney has this poem about digging, which you always read. I suppose the one where the Westerners, because when I was in Egypt, I felt I found my voice. I'd been writing for quite a few years before that, but in Egypt and that first poem, Westerners, I said, wow, I think this is the real thing at last. And I had been working at it for quite some time. So it's a long time ago, but probably I mean, there's, there's, there's always that feeling, if you, if, you, if you get something right, I mean, Larkin said, you know, you, you're always happy with a good poem, and you've laid an egg, as it were. Um, but that one, I think I'd probably say, yes. I mean, Kevin will have his own favorites, but, uh, yeah. Westerners, yeah. How did, how did you all come up with the title? Is there any meaning behind the title? John, repeat the Yes, uh, we were asked how we came up with the title. Kevin, you start, because you, you came up with it, right? That's right. Well, I think we had settled originally on another title. I think we were thinking about Western West, as a title. Yeah. Uh, but it was one that John had used before, and I, we were never entirely satisfied with that. But we thought it could work in America. And then one day, John sent me a poem called The Interpretation of Owls. And I loved the wit, the lightness. It was very different from many other of his poems. Um, there was this sort of almost um, psychoanalysis effect of it, but in a very lighthearted way. And as if John's poems themselves were being interpreted, the owls as the poems. But the best part of it was it was inspired by a painting. And at this point, I'll turn the story over to you. Yeah, is that is the painting. I, is it, my papers, something inherited from my, my father, it was this painting on it, just a bit of cardboard, which my, my grandfather had done in 1901. So around the time of Freud's interpretation of dreams. Um, and I wrote this poem, so it was only a couple of years ago, it was when we were editing the book, I think I wrote mm -hmm. it, so it was a new poem. Um, and I wrote the, the poem about that painting. And so, I think, again, you suggested, we use it as the cover image, uh, and it seems, I mean, you could just call it selected poems, like people do. Or, uh, but it's nice to have a, a general title, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything. The, the 
my worry is that people are going to say, you know, I bought this book, and it doesn't tell me anything about owls. You, know, <laughs> but, uh, you, you never know. Other questions? Hello. Um, if you can answer, um, how were you able to write such active imagery? Imagery, yes. Even though I think of myself as a, a person for whom sound is most important, uh, as Waco Hilton will tell you when I complained <laughs> last night, um, <laughs> uh, I think imagery too. Uh, it does seem to, to spark the poem. That seems to be how a poem gets going. And often it's a doubleness where something, I mean, that is what imagery is, something looks like something. Often a double, if a double meaning goes with it, like with Westerners too. So I visualise the image. Um, I used to make films as well, so perhaps I've, I've got that. So the image is at the heart of it. I used to read a lot of imagism. I like those imagist poems. And I think that's the heart of poetry, really, the way an image takes hold of, 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 of something and ha has depths within it, mysterious depths within it. Um, and there's an excitement that goes with the image. It's, it's a mysterious business, there's no doubt about it. So, and if I rationalised it too much, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. So, uh, probably best to speak no more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. No, with what kind of tree? Medlar. The medlar tree. Have I written a poem about a medlar tree? Hmm. Now, the medlar... Is that the one that's growing Shakespeare's ha new place, the medlar tree? I'm not sure, but it, it, its fruit was only ripe for a short time. Ah. Very fragrant and very tasty, but it was only ripe when it looked rotten. That's right. I, I think and Shakespeare... It's disappearing. Yeah. Well, the short answer is no, I haven't, but I, I may well you know, I do one now, in which case I should dedicate it to you, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, so, I haven't meddled with a meddler, but I, I shall investigate. I've certainly heard of it. I don't think I've even seen a meddler tree. I've seen pictures of one. I was wondering, maybe Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's one there. Intriguing. Any more? No. John, do you mind speaking a little bit uh, as yeah, concisely as you can about the, the way that your poetry uh, interacts with faith, spirituality, and religiosity in general? So, what struck me about your poetry uh, early on was the, the very subtle ways that you display sort of spirituality, this connectedness to the earth, mm. uh, this deep rootedness in place, especially. Mm. Uh, especially struck me. Uh, so, in what ways that kind of informs your writing? Yeah, it's probably connected to the image. The kind of images I use often do, like the very first poem I use, the church stuff is there. Um, and the spiritual side of it is, is, is very important to me, but it's, it's, quite, it's below the surface. And that, perhaps that's an English thing, where we're a bit less outgoing about our, our faith or our spirituality or whatever. Uh, and that's another interesting aspect of this collection, because P Kevin was choosing poems, which perhaps I've held back on a bit, because in England, people would have been a bit more sceptical, you know. So, th that's be fascinating. Uh, it's important to me, and it's finding a convincing way of writing about anything to do with God or anything to do with spirituality that doesn't sound mawkish, sentimental, insincere, and also that hasn't been done by George Herbert or John Donne or, or Emily <laughs> Dickens. Uh, so, where do you go? Um, it's best to let those things happen rather than, I'm not going to, set, I'm going to set out to write something spiritual, no. I'm going to write a poem about my grandfather's ashtray and his old pipe and suddenly there's something about spirituality and the church where his ashes now are, you know, and, and you didn't know that was going to happen. Um, so let it happen. If the, the, the spirit is willing, as it were, it'll come out. Yeah. Uh, did, did you want to say anything about that, uh, Kevin? I think that was, I couldn't possibly top that. All right. Okay. We have time for one more question, or perhaps we could persuade John to have an encore. <laughs> elegy? Oh, well, I elegy. If I, if I may make a um, suggestion. Elegy, right. This, this is another one of, of a short poem that we were relieved to hear, um, that it was just um, a pencil draft that I 
and the reject pile. But that often happens, you know. With, I'm not claiming any great quality for this, but Edmund Blundham, for example, who I talked about when I was here before, one of his most celebrated poems, he thought nothing of at all. He, he, he almost put it in the bin. Anyway, this one was called Elegy for Want of a Better Title, and it describes the landscape. So it's really we're ending where we started with that description of the hunting nature landscape. There's a walk I do regularly up, up the hill. Um, there's an old, the site of an old priory. It's also the place where Edward Wingfield, he of you know, Jamestown and Pocahontas and all that, um, was born to, in my village. So it's an atmospheric place uh, if you know something of the history. If you don't, it's very ordinary, but um, elegy. And this has got a spiritual element to it, actually. Yeah. Elegy. Perhaps it will be like this a mist hanging across a landscape almost familiar and an empty lane. On each side, a signpost indicating a footpath. The one down to where the old priory once stood, to the remains of a fresh well and some hallowed stones, to the half moon of an Augustinian moat lost in the clay and sprouting shoots of winter wheat. No track, but a field where there has been a bull. No sound, but the drop of water into the depths. The other path leads up across a stile and into the long grass, through and past the sheep and over into a huge open space where, on a mistless day, the reservoir will catch the eye a mile or two away. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, too. Thank you again, everyone, and we will see you downstairs for some cookies, cake, coffee, and tea, and water.